out into the spirit of Christ and to my two brothers that are awesome ministers in the Lord, Michael and Julius Brown, and to their beautiful wives, Raquel and Jinwa in her absence, and members and friends. Um, usually I sing a song, but I just wanted to do a medley today. It's just like four little hymns. <clears throat> He's joy unspeakable and full of glory, full of glory, full of glory. He's joy unspeakable and full of glory, and the best has never yet been told. He's joy unspeakable and full of glory, full of glory. Full of glory, he's joy unspeakable and full of glory, and the best has never yet been told. To the utmost, Jesus saves. To the utmost, Jesus saves. He will lift you up and turn you around. Hallelujah, 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 Jesus saves. To the utmost, Jesus saves. To the utmost, Jesus saves. He will lift you up and turn you around. Hallelujah, 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 Jesus saves. Yes, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, oh, yes. Just say yes, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. If we would just say yes to the Lord. This is like worship. And the Lord, we can unction him in by worship. You know, the Lord is looking for our praise and our worship. Amen. Yes, Lord, oh, yes. Just say yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Oh, yes. Just say yes. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. The Lord saved you. Why should you be bound? The Lord saved you. Why should you be bound? The Lord saved you. Why should you be bound? Why should you be bound? The Lord saved me. Why should I be bound? The Lord saved me. Why should I be bound? The Lord saved me. Why should I be bound? Why should I be bound? God bless you. Fellowship. Today is February 23rd. This Friday is a very special day. Does anybody know what this Friday is? Junie's birthday. It's my birthday. <laughs> my 55th birthday. My birthday. Amen. Amen. Older than me. No, I'm not older than you. When, one, one year, uh, Raquel got me a birthday cake. She actually put the, the wrong age on the birthday cake. She always tries to make me older than her. She's, she's my old lady. <laughs> uh, today's sermon, you know, before I say what the, the title of the sermon is, many people uh, believe in certain doctrines that, we, that are false. Many people preach that you can lose your salvation, but God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Uh, so that, that's a false doctrine. Well, how do people come across that thought that they can lose their salvation? Or how do they come across the thought that uh, a battle that we've been having lately is about whether Christ paid for the sins of the world? Did he, did, have people, have, have every, has everyone been forgiven by what happened on the cross? Or are only believers forgiven by the, by the cross? 
well, we'll answer that question in the sermon today, but to understand and to get a hold on the doctrine so that you will understand when you're receiving false doctrine, you need to understand the totality of the cross. In other words, you need to understand exactly what occurred and what happened on the cross. Yeah. When you understand that, you better understand our status or our position in Christ. You'll understand why God is able. Everything that God does, you know, they say God can do all things. God can't do all things. God can't go against His nature. Okay, God can't do something that is unjust. Everything filters through the justice of God. So when God said that the price of sin is death, that meant somebody had to die. Okay, that price had to be paid. So we're going to look today at the totality of the cross. And we're going to look at some major things that happened on the cross and what it, what it delivered us, what it enabled us. So the last sermon, the last sermon that I, I preached, and Michael preached last week, but the last one that I, I preached, I spoke of the importance of discernment, being able to hear doctrine and line it up with what you've, what you've read in Scripture and to see whether it's true or whether it's false. With the growing popularity of social media, such as YouTube, uh, as we, frequent, as we frequent social media, we put ourselves at risk of receiving false doctrine. You have so many opinions out there. Yes. And now people with the wrong opinions have a great media in which to spread their wrong opinions. So how do we know when it lines up? Or how do we know when it's true? Uh, one event that uh, caused misunderstanding of God's ultimate plan is what truly occurred at the cross. When people don't understand what really occurred at the cross, they're not secure in their salvation. No, not. They think that some sin can remove them from the hand of God. Right. I, think that, I think that many professed Christians today don't really understand what occurred on the cross. They, in today's sermon, we will look at the plan of God and through the scriptures, connect the pieces of the puzzle to view the complete plan of God. Amen? Amen. In John chapter 19, 28 through 30, Jesus from the cross expresses that the job that he came to complete was done. It states, after this, Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scriptures might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon a high stop, or a sponge, that's what a high stop is, and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. In the Greek, the word that uh, that translates out to it is finished and I like using the Greek term because how the term was used it was tetelestai when a, when a painter was working on a painting and that painting was complete and nothing else could be done to it you couldn't add to it you couldn't take away from it it was perfect he would sign his name on it and he would say tetelestai it's finished and that's what Jesus Christ said on the cross. He said the plan of God in which the purpose that he came was complete. It was done. All the work that needed to be done, he did. There's nothing that we can add to it. We can't go and go to Jesus Christ's painting and say, you know what? I think it looked really nice with blue right here. Or I think that uh, maybe we can, we can take it and shift it around and it will be more understandable. Christ said that he did all the work. He did it all. We can't add to it. We can't help him with the plan of salvation. We can't add to it. We can't sit there and say that it's not finished yet. It's not done. There's something that I need to do to perfect his plan of salvation. So... What exactly was completed on the cross? 
Sin is what separated man from God. Remember, God had created this perfect environment. He had created a perfect man. He formed Adam from the dust of the ground, and he breathed life, he breathed life into him, and he became a living soul. Amen. Adam was perfect. Adam had, you know, Brian and I were talking about this morning, we were talking about how Adam and Eve had in them the, the genetic makeup for everybody in the world. Yes, they did. For all colors, all skin colors, all the, they had, they had it all. They, they had everything, and everything came from them. Yes, it did. So Adam was perfect, and then God took from his rib, from his side, Eve, and she was perfect also because she was from a perfect man. Right. Mm -hmm. So God, what God made was perfect. Then God, what? And when God said, "Let us make man." in our image. That included free will mm -hmm. sure and yeah. choice. Mm -hmm. God wants our worship. Joey was saying in the song earlier that God wants our, our worship. He deserves our praise. Man was created to worship God. Amen. And But God doesn't want robots. Oh, yeah. he, wants, he wants our worship freely. Is, is worship really worship if we're forced to do it? You know, in, in, in Russia, when they're, when they're having an election or something, you ever notice in Russia, the, the candidate who's running always has 100% of the vote? <laughs> how, how, you know, how, how likely is that that you're not going to have one person vote against you? You know, that happens when you're standing in the square and there are machine guns on you and they say, worship, praise, clap, <laughs> because it's forced. It's force. God's not standing over us with a gun telling us to worship Him. He gave us free will so that we can worship Him and serve Him freely by our own choice. But in, in giving us free will, there had to be a way for us to disobey Him. Because if not, then we're just robots. You don't have any, any way to disobey Him. So that is why the tree was in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was in the garden. You notice it didn't say the, it didn't say the tree of evil. Because the tree wasn't evil. It was the knowledge of good and evil. Knowing the difference. Because Adam and Eve only knew what was good. You know, you hear people and they're like, you know, would a loving God allow thousands of people to die from some disease? Or, you know, me working at Elmcrest and, and working with all these uh, children who've been abused and everything, would a loving God allow that? Have you guys ever had anybody say that to you and they question the existence of God by what man is doing? Like, no, God created a perfect world. It is man who messed it up. It is sin that has brought about all this chaos in this world. So that's what, that's what happened there. So God put that tree in the garden and told them not to touch it. Don't touch it. Don't, don't eat of it. Not touch it. He said, don't eat of it. Eve added, don't touch it. <laughs> she embellished a little bit. But God said, don't eat of this tree. So there was only one thing that they couldn't do. He said, you can eat of any tree in the garden, even the one standing next to it, the tree of life. But they chose to disobey. So sin came into the world. So what happened on the cross? You know, when, when God was pronouncing judgment upon Adam, Eve, and the snake, and the serpent, he turned to the serpent and he said that there will be enmity between you, your seed, and the seed of the woman. You shall... I get it right here. You will, he will crush your head and you shall bruise his foot. His heel. His heel. That was the first prophecy of the cross. Mm -hmm. That Jesus Christ would come and that Satan would crucify him. And then the Antichrist would come and Christ would crush him. So God, God uh, manifested his plan right from the beginning. That he was going to come and he was going to pay for sin. And not that he was going to pay for some sin, but he was going to pay for all sin. Mm -hmm. He was going to remove sin out of the way. Yes. 
Now, the eternal, the eternal price for sin, in John 2.2, 2, it says, And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So how can you see a verse like that, where Christ is saying that he's paying for all sin, not just our sins, because when he says ours, who do you think he's talking to? Israel. So he's not just talking to, to Israel, saying he's just going to pay for their sins. What was that Bible verse you mean? It was John, uh, 1 John 2.2. 2. 1 John 2.2. 2. Uh, he's not saying that he's just paying for Israel's sins. He's saying he's paying for the sins of the whole world. Everybody. So even, even though here he's not dealing, he's only dealing with Israel, this message here is only for Israel, but the message itself is saying, we're not, oh, he's not just going to pay for yours, Israel, but he's going to pay for the entire world, everybody. Amen? Amen. Amen? So the effect of sin was removed at the cross. And what was the effect of sin? Death. Amen. Jesus Christ conquers death. He says death is, is the last enemy to be destroyed. Amen. Yes. Blessed is he who has no part in the second death. Amen. We're all going to die. Yes. If you live here on this earth long enough and Jesus Christ doesn't come back yet, you're, you're going to experience death. But it's the second death you don't want to be part of. Because you're going to be part of a resurrection. Are you going to be part of the resurrection when Jesus Christ appears in the sky? In the body of Christ? The little yellow section on our, our chart there? The body of Christ is removed in the rapture? Are you going to be part of that resurrection? Amen, yes. Or are you going to be part of the resurrection of the damned? When Jesus, when, when, the, uh, when all the damned of the world are, are resurrected to judgment, and they come and they stand in front of God, and they're judged. Do you know at that judgment their sin is never brought up? Because God is not a God of double jeopardy. He doesn't judge sin and take it upon himself on the cross and then say, okay, well, we're going we're, we're, we're gonna to punish you now again for your sin. Because sin is not the question. Sin is not the issue. God has given uh, us mercy. You know, when, when you hear the word mercy, how, how do you define the word mercy? You know, God showing favor to us, God being a good God to us. The word mercy is defined as God not giving to man what he justly deserves. We deserve death because of sin. But God withheld that judgment, and that is his mercy. He accomplishes this through grace. Now, how do we define grace? We define grace as God giving man what he doesn't deserve. God, we don't deserve to spend eternity with God. Not as sinners we don't. But Jesus Christ took care of the sin issue when he died on the cross and he had the sins of the world imputed to him. Do we know what imputed means? Imputed means assigned. So God took all sin from the first sin of Adam and Eve to the last sin of the thousand year reign of Christ. And he assigned them to Jesus Christ on the cross. He put those sins. The verse that we read earlier, he who knew no sin became sin for us. So Jesus Christ took all this sin upon him, and he paid the price. And when it was done, he said, it is finished. Mm -hmm. It's complete. Tetelestai. Nothing more needs to be done. It's done. So sin is no longer the question. I, asked, I, I had a Bible study with a pastor yesterday at the Jewish homes, a uh, uh, resident of Raquel's. And he, he asked that I come in and do a Bible study with him. So I was, I was honored to go in and sit down with him and do a Bible study. And I asked him a question. I said, Jesus Christ paid for the sins of the world. Correct? He said, yes. I said, well, if, if he paid for the sins of the world, then why is anybody going to hell? And he sat there and he thought, he said, I don't know. 
<clears throat> because people don't realize sin is not the issue. When, when those people are resurrected to damnation, to condemnation, their sins are paid for. Their sins are not an issue. What the issue is, is righteousness. Have you been declared righteous? Have you been declared righteous by the King of Kings, by the Lord of Lords? Have you been imputed righteousness from Him? Because He came, He fulfilled the law. He did everything that needed to be done. He, he never sinned. He has perfect righteousness. We need His perfect righteousness. Mm -hmm. And when we believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, Amen. we have imputed to us the perfect righteousness of Christ. We now have what we need to stand in the presence of an all-consuming God. Amen. An all-consuming fire for eternity. We now have the ticket. We have the ticket. To, you know you're going to the movies. They check the ticket. You've got to have the ticket to get in. If you don't have a ticket, then you can't get in. The ticket to get in to heaven is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ by faith. Mm -hmm. Not by works that any man should boast. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that we can do to earn it. Christ already did it on the cross. He did all that was needed to be done. We only need to receive the gift of salvation that he has made possible for us by his death on the cross. Amen? Amen? Now, sin was, as I said, was removed as a blockade, and God is holy. He is perfect holiness. He demonstrates his perfect holiness many times in scriptures. When Adam and Eve sinned, God atones for their transgression by slaying an animal and covering their nakedness. God's justice says that there has to be a way for... he can't. God can't just say, okay, I'm going to look the other way. I know you sinned. I'm going to bring you back in anyway. Uh, we're not going to worry about this sin. No, God is a perfect and just God. Mm -hmm. So there had to be a way of repairing the breach. And a temporary payment for that... Uh, not even a payment for sin. A temporary covering of that sin. Mm -hmm. Of covering it up. Saying that, okay... We're going, to allow, uh, we're going to allow fellowship, but we have to have something to cover this up. Because, so, so God says, oh, that's it, I'm not going to judge this right now. So the slaying of the animal, the, the uh, covering with skins, that was a picture of God saying, not by thy works, but by mine. Amen. Yes. By my work, Amen. this will be covered up, not by your own. Amen? Amen. Amen. So then we again see another picture with Cain and Abel. When Cain comes and he's, he's offering sacrifice for the same atonement. Because this, this is something that happens. It has to happen frequently. In the nation of Israel, every year they had to come and they had to atone for their sins. This, this was a shadow of what was to come when the perfect would come. But Cain doesn't follow instructions. He received instruction from Adam and Eve on how to properly worship God and how to atone for sin. Mm -hmm. But what does he do? He, he, he says, I'm going to do this my way. I've worked hard on my crops. He was a tiller of the ground. So he says, you know what? I'm proud of my, of my crop. <laughs> I'm proud of what I have done. Let me present this to God, and he can be proud of what I did too. So he offers his nuts and berries to God. And God says, you give me that which has been cursed. You give me what has been cursed. And God rejects it. But Abel comes, and Abel follows the pattern. The pattern that he was taught from Adam and Eve. The pattern that God demands. So what, what you have to learn from this is you got to do it God's way. Amen. Can't do it our own way. It doesn't matter what we grew up learning. It doesn't matter how we have thought of things. It matters what saith the word of God. Amen. That's how we have to do it. We have to present to God that we will be acceptable unto him. We've got to follow his plan. God, God mapped this all out from the beginning. Who are we to sit there and say, well, I, I, I don't care how your plan says to do it. This is how I want to do it. Mm -hmm. You'll be rejected. 
Sure you will. But God had a plan. And it was a good one. Marvin Sapp sings a song. He says, God, he says, I know you have a plan, but God's got a better one. <laughs> so in order for there to be a path to reconciliation to God, sin as a whole had to be dealt with. Paul references this truth in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 21 through 22. And he says, For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. You know, Christ is called the second Adam. The last Adam. Yeah. Last Adam. Mm -hmm. And the reason he's called that is sin entered the world through one Adam. The punishment for sin exited through, a, through another Adam. Mm -hmm. So Jesus Christ took care of sin, not just some sin, not for just those who believe in him. He didn't, he didn't pick and choose what sin he was going to die for. He died for sin, all of it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Yes. Amen. Thus, with sin removed, we only need to apply faith to Christ's finished work and believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, and we are saved. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we are as we are reconciled unto him, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 18 through 19 says, All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and that he committed to us the message of reconciliation. Amen. You know, when you're, when you're married, sometimes you have arguments. Sometimes you have fights. You need to have reconciliation. You need to sit down, either talk it out, whatever, and then you forgive each other. You know, if you don't forgive somebody for some wrong that they've done, what happens? Things seem like they're okay, but then something happens, and then you start bringing up things that happened before. You start trying to beat that person up with some error that they made years ago. Mm -hmm. Thank God, God is a, a, a just God of reconciliation, that He's not bringing up any of our old sins. He doesn't bring any sin up. Every time a sin comes up, every time Satan comes in front of God accusing a saint, do you know what Christ says? He says, I paid for that. Amen. I paid for that sin. Amen. 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 So Christ's death, burial, and resurrection made the path by mercy and grace of God that man now could be reconciled unto God. It's what he did on the cross. That's what made the path. You've got to take the path, though. In order to get reconciled, you got to take the walk. You've got to believe that Jesus Christ did this for you. You've got to accept the gift. You've got to do it God's way. Death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. You know, that's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And He associates you. Because that's what, that's what baptism means. It means association, to be associated with. Amen. When... When John the Baptist was baptizing the Israelites, he was associating them with the fact that the Messiah had come. Mm -hmm. That the Messiah was here and they were to be anointed to the nation of priests. Mm -hmm. When Moses, the first baptism, when the, when the Israelites were crossing through the Red Sea and God had just parted it, they were associated with Moses and God's plan and his working with Moses. And they, bat they were baptized, and they didn't get wet. Amen. It was a dry baptism. Amen. And then the next baptism was the, the, the Egyptians who were following them through. And they got baptized unto death. They got associated with death. Amen. And they got wet. <laughs> they got real wet. <laughs> so... Certain things that we have in reconciliation in the body of Christ. No longer is there a temple in Israel that God dwells in. 
Do you know where the Holy Spirit dwells now? Amen. He dwells in us. Amen. We are His temple. Amen. God does the circumcision without hands. He cuts away the flesh so that He has a holy place to dwell. A place without sin. The sin is in, the, in our flesh. God separates and He makes a new man in us. And he, this is how He deals. This is how He leads us. How He guides us. How He, how he gives us Scripture. How He gives us understanding for Scripture. He, he is everything that we need. So if sin was not made, it, if sin was not made of no effect, the Holy Spirit could not indwell in us. Sin had to be conquered. It had to be conquered. It has to be not an issue. If not, the Holy Spirit could not take up residency in us. Amen. But He has. And in Christ, we are joint heirs. You know, when, when somebody dies and they write up a will and you're an heir, you, you find out, you know, Raquel and I always joke around. We say, you know, we don't know where when we die, we don't know who we're going to leave our grandfather clock to because all our kids are petrified of our grandfather clock ever since they were young. So we don't know who we're going to leave that to. We may probably leave it to one of the grandkids or something. <laughs> but Christ, we are joint heirs with him. Everything that he has been blessed with, the, the package that he has, we are joint heirs and we share with him. And we are, we are going to be presented perfect and holy in front of the Father. That is, where, that is what our inheritance is. That's what it's, it sits there and it says, right on, right on it says, Julius Brown, joint heir in Christ, to be Amen. presented perfect and holy. Mm -hmm. Michael Brown, Bernardo Paredes, Raquel, Joanne, your names are written to be presented perfect and holy. Amen? Amen. Amen. Yes. Amen. Amen. So the last thing that we're going to talk about that happened at the cross and that we get from when, when we apply faith and not before. We are justified in Christ. Amen. You know what it means to be justified? Amen. It means to be declared righteous. Amen. Declared righteous. So how do you... So got ahead of myself here. I said, how do you define justification? It is defined as God declaring those who receive Christ to be righteous based on Christ's righteousness, not our own, nothing that we can do for ourselves. <clears throat> Just as sin was imputed to Christ on the cross, His perfect righteousness is imputed to us. Yes, it's it assigned to us. Mm -hmm. So when God looks at us and He says, I need to look at a righteous being, He sees the righteousness of Christ when He looks at me. Amen. When he looks at us, he sees the perfect righteousness of Christ. Yes, he does. And that's the only way that you can stand in his presence. I believe that this is where many Christians get it confused. Mm -hmm. They think that their sin is an issue. So they worry. Oh, did I, did I not pray today? Did I, did I not do this today? Did I not do that? You're worrying about something that's already been paid for and is Amen. no longer an issue. Amen. Yes. You're not depending upon the, the finished work of Christ for your salvation. Mm -hmm. You're thinking that there's something that you can do to add to the painting that he meant and said that it was finished. Mm -hmm. Many believe that only believers, only believers' sins are forgiven. But if that were the case, then Christ, he, he couldn't just pay for part of it. He had to conquer sin as a complete entity mm -hmm. and take it out of the way or we never would have had a path to salvation mm -hmm. because sin would continually be an issue. Mm -hmm. Sin being conquered by Christ on the cross cannot deliver perfect righteousness. Only being justified by Christ, being declared righteous by God can deliver us righteousness. Mm -hmm. Amen. This is what justification does. This is where... When we believe, God declares us righteous in Christ. Mm -hmm. Romans chapter 4, verse 5 says, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Yes, it is. Amen. Every week we 
make sure we cover the gospel. In case there's somebody out there uh, watching on YouTube who's never heard the gospel, you know, when you when you go to a funeral, and, and, you know, you have you have a captive audience at a funeral. Yeah. Mm -hmm. People are uh, in tune with their uh, their morality that they're not going to live forever. You know, you just had a family member or a friend die, and you know, you think about you know this this could happen to me. So it's always a good time to give the gospel because people are maybe a little bit more receptive to it. In in all the funerals that I've been to, I can only think of a couple that I've heard. The real God, the actual gospel, the gospel that saves, the gospel that the Bible says saves us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, the Apostle Paul, the Apostle to the Gentiles, says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. So if you think that he was talking about something else, he's telling you, no, this is the gospel. This is it which I preached unto you, which also you have ye have received, and wherein ye stand. So, not only did I preach it to you, but you accepted it, and you understand it, and this is where you make your stand. This is where you say, yeah, I understand, I get it, this is it. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. So, if you believe something else, other than the message that I, I gave to you, you believed it in vain. It's of no value to you. Mm -hmm. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which also I received, that how Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. He died for sin. It, it's written and recorded in Scripture, in God's Word, so you can bank on it. It's true. Mm -hmm. For I delivered unto you, first of all, which I so I received how Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that how he was buried, and you're not buried unless you're really dead. Amen. The Muslims say that Jesus Christ didn't die on the cross. That it was a big hoax. The Jews took him down. You know, it's a funny thing that the, the Muslims actually believe that Jesus Christ is going to be resurrected. They believe he's going to be resurrected in the future. Okay? And lastly, in that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. The resurrection is important. The resurrection is God saying that Jesus Christ as a sacrifice for sin is acceptable. Amen. So when Jesus Christ said it's complete, the work is done, and God said it's accepted. He, and he resurrected him. And put him in a resurrected body where he can suffer no more, he can, he can be killed no more. And he's sitting on the right hand of power, waiting to come back, waiting to come back and pick us up. Amen. Amen. I look to the sky every day and hoping that that is that day. Amen? Amen. Amen. Mike, do you want to close this up in prayer? Yes, and thank you, Father God. We praise you for the opportunity to worship you in spirit and in truth, for the opportunity to present your holy word, rightly divided, to bring you honor and glory and praise which you richly deserve. We thank you for Jesus Christ's death on that cross, paying for all of our sins, 100%, that he actually died and was buried, and that he rose from the dead. He was resurrected. And, and if he wasn't resurrected, neither will we be resurrected. That resurrection is so important. We praise you and thank you. We believe in his death on the cross, the payment for our sins. We believe that he was buried. And we believe that he rose again to the saving of our souls. You've done all the work. You deserve all the credit. We praise you and thank you now in Jesus' holy name for his precious, precious shed blood on that cross. In Jesus' name we thank you, Father God. Amen. Amen.